There's Jazz tomorrow afternoon. Two films, in fact, beginning at 2.30 with Jazz in Exile, which explores why some of America's finest musicians live and work in Europe. And that's followed by Jazz is Our Religion, a portrait of jazz style and stylists created through music, poetry and some superb photography. Tomorrow on 4, Life Cycle, and in the second of five programmes dealing with women's health, Miscarriage. I was sort of devastated, really. I didn't know if it was my fault. I didn't realise that there is a mourning process with, with miscarriage. And of course there is, and after a, a good old howl, you do feel better. But many women do grieve at this failure, as they perceive it. And just brushing them aside and saying, don't worry about it, really isn't enough. Coping with the clinical and emotional trauma of miscarriage. Life cycle, tomorrow at 10.30 on 4. Now on 4, time to return to Westminster for the meet of today's debates that took place in their Lordship's house. Employment Secretary Lord Young has announced a new white paper, setting out proposals to make life easier for businesses. It's a follow-up to the white paper published last July, which set up a central task force to vet new business regulations. Entitled Building Businesses Not Barriers, the white paper sets out ways of helping businesses by removing unnecessary regulations. It contains 80 proposals, which the government say will cut red tape. Among the measures specifically aimed at small businesses are an easing of planning restrictions, a review of VAT on small firms, and a reduction in the number of visits to small businessmen by government officials. The white paper reflects our firm belief that only by removing barriers to business will enterprise flourish and the essential creation of wealth and jobs follow. It presents a balanced program which recognises that government has a role in providing legal protection for workers, consumers and the general public, as well as protecting the environment and our quality of life. However, it also, my lords, recognises that unnecessary regulations act as an inhibition to business growth and job creation. Labour's industry spokesman, Lord Bruce, welcomed the idea of cutting red tape, but said that that work. wasn't enough. Really, it is no good for the noble lord to try and get away with it, to say that all we really have to do to increase jobs is to ease a few regulations here and a few regulations there. The indictment is on the government on its economic and financial policies. This is where the problem lies. And unless those are altered speedily, there'll be no decrease in the appalling uh, unemployment figures. The Liberal leader, Baroness Sear, was worried that some protective measures were being abolished without proper consideration. My Lord. After all, my Lords, the protective legislation, some of it at any rate, in the past, has, been the, has followed very careful investigation by expert people from the fact inspectorate, yeah, from yeah. health and safety, in <laughs> other areas, uh, to what extent are the experts in the problems arising uh, in protection of employees and of the environment, how much have they come into the consideration and the measurement, as it says here, of the consequences? With... Independent Conservative Lord Olport asked about the effects on unemployment. <clears throat> well, there's any estimate of the, the number of additional jobs which will be provided as a result of the... Uh, Excuse the implementation of the proposals in the white paper? My Lords, this is part of a continuing process, and I would not like anyone in your Lordship's house to think that government is so all-knowing that it can determine to an immense degree of exactitude the number of jobs created or lost by any decision of government. Enterprise is not like that. Employment is not like that. What government has to do is get out of the way of the people so that the people can create the jobs. 
One of the Lord's Select Committees has been looking at the question of nuclear power in the EEC, a particularly topical question at the moment after Chernobyl. Nuclear power currently accounts for around 25% of the community's energy. The European Commission have recommended that the proportion should be increased to 40% by 1995. Since February, the committee has been examining the possible difficulties in the way of that Commission target. After Chernobyl, the most important of those difficulties now is probably public and political opinion. The committee has a particularly high-powered membership. Chaired by oil executive Viscount Torrington, it also includes Lord King, the chairman of British Airways, Lord Swan, former chairman of the BBC, Lord Zuckerman, the government's former chief scientific advisor, and Lord Kirton, former chairman of the British National Oil Corporation. Among the witnesses were two Euro MPs, reporting on European attitudes towards nuclear energy. Viscount Torrington asked about the possibility of inspecting Soviet reactors. Given the military nature of the Russian reactors, especially the RBMK reactors, I mean, what chance do we really think there would be that they will submit to the kind of rigorous international inspection, both pre-building pre design, commissioning, etc., that you suggested. The Russians have agreed to inspection for safeguard purposes, i.e. non-proliferation, and the very fact that uh, they've done that presumably means it's not a big step to uh, allowing technical appraisal of their military dual-purpose plants. Obviously, the one thing they want to keep quiet is the amount of plutonium they're producing, but apart from that, the way they do it should be under inspection. Lord Kitten asked about public anxiety after the Chernobyl accident. One has to accept that the Russians, in designing this reactor, in operating it, and have operated it for, in prototype forms, for 20 years, believed they had a safe reactor. And then they find it's not safe. Similarly, the Three Mile Island, the American public were assured they had a safe reactor. Then they found it wasn't safe. And all the statistics that one gets about the integrity of reactors, there's always a chance it's going to break down. The chance may be one in a million, one in ten million, and so on. There's always a chance. Therefore, the public's going to say, what's going to make things safe for us? And doesn't it come down to much more containment as a policy? And shouldn't the Commission and the various governments satisfy the public that even in the unlikely event of an accident, the containment is going to be much more rigorous than at present. The time for explanation has come, and as you say, there will always be mistakes. So what you've got to um, make quite plain to the public is, if it's the fact, that you have got so many backups to any mistake that you can conceive of, that you've got an antidote. It's fair to say that the comparison between reactor types has been very much a matter of economics up to now. Mm. And perhaps yes. it would be a good thing if the emphasis was placed yes. much more on inherent safety. Yeah. In both cases, in Three Mile Island and in Chernobyl, it was the human error that in fact is thought to have caused the accident. And therefore, one's got to look into a much greater degree of automation. And I gather this is where the Russians are not very hot. They don't have the computer technology that we have in the West uh, to do this efficiently. It may well be the electronics that broke down at Chernobyl. There is the other problem. If you're an operator in a nuclear power station, when, you, when do you decide there's an emergency? When do you decide that you have to destroy the, <coughs> the reactor? And I think much more attention has got to be given to supervision, training of supervisors, and a proper routine to shut down the reactor immediately. A red light comes on. If I may say so, your answer can only add to public disquiet about the way in which nuclear power stations have been operated to date. Another witness from Babcock Power had been worried about safety when visiting Chernobyl 11 years ago. He was questioned by Lord Zuckerman. Your view is that the Chernobyl design would not meet our safety regulations. Yes. Equally, that you've had a fair amount of discussion with the Russians. Yes. In their design, uh, do they use different standards for worker exposure from ours? I would think so. Uh, and I don't know. It wasn't a it wasn't a point that we uh, we discussed with them. Did and I was convinced that there was uh, active steam uh, escaping from on, on the file cap when I was uh, standing on it because I couldn't see where else it was coming from and there was steam there, uh, which is not something we would have uh, contemplated in the UK. And equally, the the turbines weren't uh, weren't shielded and. Uh, 
uh, because the steam was active going to the turbines, we would have had shielding around the turbine. The committee hopes to publish its report by July, in time for submission to the Sizewell inquiry. It was the second day of the committee stage of the airports bill, which privatises seven British airports, including Heathrow and Gatwick. Labour proposed an amendment to impose restrictions on working hours for air traffic controllers, similar to those for pilots. I think everyone will agree that if air traffic controllers are working excessive hours, then one can be in, in danger uh, for the, the whole question of civil aviation traffic. Because what I would really like to know is whether the government appreciates, maybe not the wording of my amendment, that there should be consideration given to laying down some limitation of air traffic controllers and hours. It is a terribly serious matter. There's an interesting quote in Flight International magazine this morning by Mr. Miller of the American National Transportation Safety Board. And he says, if you need an accident to know you have a problem, then you are part of the problem. And I asked the government to take that quotation rather seriously in looking at this very important part of civil aviation. A former chairman of the Civil Aviation Authority questioned whether regulations were necessary. Once you start laying down statutory hours, you introduce a rigidity and an inflexibility into the system, which may not in fact be very helpful or even conducive to safety. And uh, uh, on the old basis that where it's not necessary to change, it's necessary not to change, I would express some doubts as to whether there is any um, need to do this. Indeed, there is a danger of substituting an inflexible and mechanical regime for the present system of checks and inspections, which can respond far more readily to changing patterns of demand at an airport, the very flexibility that my noble friend Lord Boyd Carpenter has just drawn our attention to. Lord Underhill withdrew his amendment, but may reintroduce it later. In questions, Labour's Home Affairs spokesman, Lord Mishcon, asked about the recruitment of extra police officers to the Metropolitan Police. He wanted to know why only 1,200 were being taken on, when Commissioner Sir Kenneth Newman said 3,000 were needed to police London adequately. My lords, does the noble lord, the minister, recollect the resounding promise made by his right honourable friend, the prime minister, at the last conservative conference, that what the police needed, they were going to get? Bearing in mind that the commissioner for the Metropolitan Police has said that he needs 3,000 recruits adequately to police the metropolis, as I have said in my original question, would he indicate to the House what the position is? Is the commissioner wholly irresponsible in asking for that immediately and only getting about 10% of his demand? Or his right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, a breaker of promises? Right Honourable Friend, the Prime Minister is certainly not a breaker of promises. What, what my right...